All right, it's a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, just a little background on myself. I'm, I've been in Kentucky for five years now. And uh, it's been a really nice move. I was in, in Virginia and enjoyed it there for 17 years at Virginia Tech. Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about bale grazing and, and how we can use it to, to stretch our, our fertilizer dollars. And, and not just bale grazing, but I'm going to kind of take a holistic approach to, to soil fertility within grazing systems. Since we're a pretty small group tonight, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to just ask them as we go along. And we are recording tonight's presentations, and they'll be available on our, our uh, KY Forges YouTube channel if you'd like to go back and watch them or share them with someone else that maybe wasn't here tonight. So let's talk a little bit about how we can stretch our fertilizer dollars. And what I want to do is kind of give you about 10 tips um, on stretching your fertilizer dollars and then really spend a little bit of time on bale grazing in, in a little bit more detail. So, so you all are familiar with this. If you would have told me two years ago that I'd still be standing up here talking about high fertilizer prices, I'd I wouldn't have believed you. Usually it seems like they go up pretty fast and come down pretty fast, but it seems like it's been persistent. And um, last week I called and got prices from Agrichem in Princeton, and we were still at $9.85 a ton for urea, um, $912 a ton for DAP, and uh, $829 a ton for murate of potash. So, so they're still extremely high. In fact, the last point on this graph was a year ago, and, and they're higher than that last point in the graph one year ago, about $150 a ton. So what I want to do tonight is just give you some tips on, on how we can uh, stretch our fertilizer dollars in uh, ruminant livestock systems, primarily cow-calf systems. I'm going to move the other side. I'm getting a good glare on that screen here. That's much better. Um, the first tip is that there is no silver bullets. And if, if you all are on Facebook, I don't know if, how many of you are on Facebook, but there's always um, ads about some miracle product that's going to solve all your problems. And, and there is no miracle product. You know, and it's important to realize that. I did a meeting last night in Callaway County, and a lady, I talked about a, one of those miracle products, and she came up and said, oh, I almost bought a lot of that for my farm. And so it was a good, it was good that she was there. You want to avoid products that sound too good to be true, just like your mom told you when you were little. If, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There's some biological products out there that show promise, and, uh, but they're not, not quite there yet. So, um, so we just have to be careful and have realistic expectations for those. Um, make sure you ask for replicated data. These guys that sell these products hate it when you ask for replicated data because they don't have any. They have testimonials. Um, so ask for replicated data from university trials. And here's, I, I think, one of our biggest offenders. And that's a company called uh, Agritech, and they're out of Georgia, and they sell a, um, a number of products, um, liquid lime or liquid calcium, they call it. And they have prolific ads on Facebook. Some of you have probably seen them. They promise you everything that you can think of, neutralizing soil acidity, increasing NP and K of, uh, movement into the plant, promotes root development, increases water infiltration into the soil, and the list goes on and on. The best thing you can do with this product is just simply don't use it. So, so be careful and, and, and be a little bit suspicious when somebody brings you a new product. Call your agent, ask your agent about it, and, and make sure that it's, it's a solid product with replicated research behind it. Now, one of the beautiful things about cow-calf operations is that, that we can develop very strong nutrient cycles. And when we develop those nutrient cycles, we can kind of wean ourselves off of commer commercial fertilizer in, to some extent. Not, not completely, but to some extent. In a cow-calf system, we have inputs in terms of things that come into the system, in like fertilizer, manure, legumes, which bring nitrogen in from the air through symbiotic nitrogen fixation, anything we feed our animals, commodity feeds, hay, minerals, they all bring nutrients into that system, and they get cycled around. So they get 
on the pasture, the plant takes them up, the animal eats the plant, and then what happens? 80 to 90 percent of those nutrients go back out onto the pasture, right, in the form of dung and urine. And over time, and with good grazing management, we can build quite a strong nutrient cycle in, in grazing systems. Exports are in the form of calves in a cow-calf system. And they're relatively small, and that's what makes this type of a system so sustainable. So if we look at nutrient removal from a cow-calf pair, and this is some data from John Laurie, who was at the University of Missouri, um, we remove about 10 pounds of nitrogen with about seven pounds of P2O5 and about a pound of potash from one cow-calf pair. And if we, if we do the, the, the math and say that we're stocked at two acres per cow-calf unit, we're removing very small quantities of nutrients from the system. Now, um, we're going to talk about what can happen in a cow-calf system in a couple slides, and that's redistribution of nutrients within that system if we don't have good grazing management. So the second tip is, is something that your extension agents harp on you about all the time, and that's taking soil samples. And we're going to have a really good example in a little bit about why it's important to take soil samples. So soil sampling quantifies primarily uh, soil pH, um, phosphorus and potassium, but not nitrogen. Nitrogen is highly mobile in the soil, so we don't actually measure nitrogen. We're making recommendations um, based on, on previous research for nitrogen. Now, it provides us baseline data so that we can manage our soil fertility program. And, and people say, well, fertilizer price is so high, there's no way I'm going to put any fertilizer on, so I'm not taking a soil test. This is the time when you really need to be taking a soil test, right? Because it allows you to really target your applications. So instead of putting on a 10-10-10 or a triple 19, we, we can put on just what we need, phosphorus, or if we just need potassium, we just put potassium on. But it really allows you to target your applications now. So when fertilizer prices are high, that's the most important time to be taking a uh, soil test. Just a little bit on, um, just a few tips on soil sampling. Um, the, the results of your soil test are only as good as they are representative of your field. So if you don't get a good soil test, then, then they aren't worth a lot. So it's important to get a good soil test. So you want your samples to be representative of the, the unit that you're testing. You want your areas that you're testing to be 20 acres or less. You want to take 15 to 20 cores in a zigzag pattern. A sampling depth of four inches. And, and I know that sounds silly for me to be standing up here telling you that, but I, I can't tell you when I go to an extension meeting and I'll ask the, the group, you know, how deep should we be taking our soil samples? I'll get answers from two to 12 inches. You know, so four inches is really important because that's what our soil, soil test calibrations are uh, calibrated off of is that four inch sampling depth. And then we want to avoid atypical areas, and those are animals, areas where animals congregate at. So where do animals congregate at? Shade, water, where we feed hay, where we might feed a supplement, where the mineral is. Those are all areas that we do not want to include in that soil sample because they will elevate the results falsely because nutrients tend to concentrate around those areas in pastures. And then make sure you do your paperwork. We have a really good soil sampling publication. I'm not saying that because I wrote it, but, but it is simple. It, it is well defined. Um, you've got nice highlighted uh, bullets for you to, to look through. Uh, Edwin Ritchie and I wrote it from the research station in Princeton. And it's specifically for hay fields and pastures. Tip number three, apply lime according to soil test. Right now, of, of all the things that we can uh, put on our pastures in terms of inputs, lime is going to be our best buy, right? Fertilizer has gone crazy. NP and K has gone crazy, but lime is a little bit higher because of trucking costs and diesel fuel, but, but really it's still a pretty good buy if you need it. And the only way you know if you're going to need it is if you get a soil test. So um, acidity is still a big factor limiting overall forage production in the southeastern United States. And it does two things. It reduces um, nitrogen fixation in legumes in grazing situations, and it reduces the availability of other nutrients in the soil. 
So if we look at um, this diagram, each one of these different bands represents a different nutrient. And the wider the band is, the more plant available that nutrient is. What I want you to notice is that when we're in this ideal pH range, which would be between 6 and 7, all of our macronutrients in our pastures, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, they're all the most plant available. It, and that's why I, I'm stressing this is because if you need, uh, need lime in your pastures, it's going to be the best buy that you can possibly put on your pastures. So it neutralizes soil acidity and it supplies calcium and magnesium. In, in most cases for pastures, we want to be between 6 and 6.4. If we can stay between 6 and 6.4, we're going to create an environment which is, encourages the growth of legumes like red clover and, and white clover in our pastures that are going to bring nitrogen into our grazing system through uh, symbiotic nitrogen fixation. So tip number four. Do not apply phosphorus and potassium if you're in the medium soil test range. And, and this is why, is once we get into the medium soil test range, our relative yield response for both phosphorus and potassium really starts to trail off. So we're, we expect, if we're in the very low range and the low range, we expect that we're going to get a response to that additional fertilizer. When we get into the medium range, it kind of gets questionable whether we're going to get that response or not. So if you're in the medium range, especially if you're towards the middle of it, this is probably not a great time to be putting a lot of extra P and K on your pastures. Tip number five, implement rotational stocking. It doesn't sound much like a soil fertility tip, does it? No. Um, this is a summary of, of research that was done comparing continuous and rotational stocking. And um, this was replicated university research. And what they found was is when you switch from a continuous to a rotational stocking system, you increase, increase pasture productivity by about 30%. So, so that's, that's pretty important. The, the other thing that rotational stocking does is it improves nutrient distribution in pastures. And we don't talk enough about this um, to our producers. So if we have one large pasture boundary and we're out here and uh, animals are out here grazing, they go back to where shade and water, right? And, and they kind of lounge around there, maybe lay down and ruminate. And then what happens when they get up? They, what? They lift their tail, very good. I like to say that it's like going to the bank. They make a deposit, right? And over time, what they do is they'll pick nutrients up here and concentrate them around shade and water. And so when, what can we do about that? Well, if we implement a rotational stocking system, we place some, some well-thought-out waters within this system. We subdivide our pastures. We put our cows in one paddock and we say, you know, you need to graze here and you need to deposit those nutrients back here. We're going to get a much more uniform distribution of nutrients within that grazing system. So that's one of the hidden benefits of rotational stocking that we don't talk enough about. Tip six, capitalize on nutrients in hay. So if we assume that one ton of hay has 35 pounds of nitrogen, which is a a pretty fair assumption. It'll vary a little bit from, from hay lot to hay lot. 12 pounds of P205 and 55 pounds of, of K2O or potash. Um, and we assume the cost of the nutrients for what we talked about at the beginning of this. Dollar a pound for nitrogen is what the current price is, 57 cents for P205 and 70 cents for K2O. One ton of hay is going to have about somewhere between 70 and $80 worth of nutrients in it. Seventy to eighty dollars. So if I'm buying hay, I was at a meeting last night in Callaway in um, in Graham Cofield, which is one of the extension agents, had bought some hay, and I think he paid sixty dollars a bale delivered for the hay, and there was about there were probably twelve hundred pounds. There were pretty big bales, um, so he was paying somewhere around one hundred twenty dollars a ton for that hay. It's pretty nice if you get back a coupon for $72 for, for the nutrients in that hay. 
Now, the value of those nutrients are going to depend a lot on how we, how we manage that hay feeding, right? And that's kind of what we want to talk a little bit about now. So we always want to feed hay on our, our worst paddocks, the ones that are in the need, most in need of the nutrients. How, how do we identify those? With the soil test, that's right. And we want to move our feeding points around. And, um, and there's lots of different ways to do that. We can, we can set bales out at different places. We can use hay rings. We can unroll hay. But, but the goal is to get those feeding points distributed around the pasture. And, and the last one is, is bale grazing. And that's the one that I want to look a little bit closer at now. We had a, a great conference, grazing conference, uh, about three weeks ago. And, um, and bale grazing was on the conference, and that video is available on our um, webpage. I'll show you where it is in a minute. So this is kind of the typical scenario, right? So we've got this, these pastures. We usually choose one pasture close to a, a good solid road, right? And we feed hay in that pasture, right? So all of our hay gets fed in that pasture. I was on a farm in Owensboro the other day, and the guy was proud to show me where he fed his hay at. About a 300 by 300 foot area feeds 200 bales there every year. He told me for decades. Is that a good a good use of his nutrients in the hay? Probably not. And um, would you ever buy a, a get a buggy of fertilizer from a from a co-op and and go to one paddock in your system and spread all that fertilizer in one paddock? And that's essentially what what's happening when you feed hay all in one place. So the better scenario is if I could just spread that feeding out all over that pasture. And if I can do that, I'm going to get a much more uniform distribution of nutrients. And I'm going to capture the value of those nutrients in the hay. Not 100% of them, but, but a good portion of them. I want to take, take a minute, and I, uh, Nick Roy said it was OK to share some of his slides from the grazing conference with you. And uh, Nick did an outstanding job um, talking about hay feeding strategies to build fertility and grazing systems. Nick's the extension agent in Adair County. And he kind of tag teamed this presentation with one of his producers who is actually bale grazing, uh, Fred Thomas. And um, we'll show you some pictures from his farm. First thing Nick said is start with a soil test. And um, and there's different ways to divide the farm up. You can uh, <coughs> switch to 20, uh, divide everything up into 20 acres. You can look at soil type, cropping history, soil erosion potential, past management are all ways that we can start to divide that farm up for soil testing. So the, this was a, a typical um, sampling of existing fields that he did here. Uh, it was based on crop management, whether it was hay or pasture, and it yielded four samples for this farm. And then the typical application was we took those four samples, we kind of got an average, right, or maybe two averages, and then we put down that average amount of fertilizer. That's probably not the best approach, right, because we're probably over-applying in some areas and under-applying in other areas. But because of logistics, that, that often happens. So this is more of a strategic sampling. And that's what, um, that's what Nick and his producer did on this farm. So they went out and they actually looked at that farm. They looked at um, you know, where hay had been fed in the past. And he kind of outlined those in red. And then they looked at where the old tobacco patches were, because they're probably be high in fertility. They looked where. Uh, tobacco stalks or manure was applied in the past. And, and they mapped all these areas out. And then they came in, and they, that's how they defined their soil testing units for that farm. Some were smaller than 20 acres, um, and, and that's OK. But there was something unique about each one of these soil testing units. And they had 11 total samples instead of the original four. And um, and this is what they found. So, so maybe this was grouped together, but there was two, actually two pieces in here. One was very high in potassium, and one was low. Um, very low and very high, right beside each other. 
um, because of past management history. The point is, is they now they have a, a plan in the ability to address those areas on the farm that are lower in soil fertility because they did a good job designing a strategic soil testing program. So this is a chart that Nick put together, and it, it's kind of similar to the one that I had that said a ton of hay has about $72 worth of nutrients in it, but he did it for different size bales. He's got a 4 by 5 a 5 by 5 and a 5 by 6 bale. And then he has the weight range and then the average weight of the bale um, in the third column. And then the nutrients, um, nutrient replacement cost in the last column. So for a, a 4 by 5 it's $33. And if we move up to a 5 by 6 you know it's $58 of nutrients in each bale of hay. And if you do the math on those bales, it comes out to about $78 a ton of nutrients in each bale of hay. So pretty, pretty close to my original calculation. And those are the numbers that he based it on in their December 2021 quotes. Let's talk about hay feeding strategies. And, and this is certainly one hay feeding strategy. This is a, a fence line feeding system. And, and these are pretty pretty popular with producers because they give you easy access for feeding hay, right? So I bring the bale up, I go ahead and put the bale in here, the animals come up and, and graze, and it's really easy for me to feed the bales into that system. And, and there certainly is a, um, convenience is certainly an important thing when we think about feeding systems, especially during the winter months. But what, what happens in a system like this? You get a good distribution of the nutrients in the hay? Probably not a great one, right? So most of the nutrients in that hay are going to be concentrated from, from here to uh, the edge of the road. And, um, and we can handle those. I mean, we can redistribute those nutrients, right, with a manure spreader. And, and that's possible, but we do lose a lot of nutrients along the way, right? The urine probably is not going to be captured as well as it should be, um, and, and so forth. Plus, it's a lot more work, and it gets pretty, pretty nasty close to the road there, for the animals at least. For you, it's okay because you're coming in from a hard surface road. This is probably a, a, the most efficient manure distribution system that we have. And um, this is strip grazing stockpiled tall fescue. And, and those animals get a little allotment, maybe enough for two to three days. And when you give them a little strip like that, that distribution of manure is so much more uniform across that pasture area. Um, I, I enjoy looking at manure because I, I value it as a nutrient source in, in pastures. And, you know, if we have a healthy grassland ecosystem, you'll see right here is a, anybody know what that is? A dung beetle. Who said dung beetle? All right. So a dung beetle. And, and so I would encourage you when you walk out in your pastures to check the animals, don't do it with your fingers, but take a stick with you and peel back that uh, skin off of a, a one or two day old cow patty and, and see if you've got dung beetles. They, in, they do an important service for us. I mean, they're taking that dung and, and tunneling down into the ground and introducing that dung back into the ground. So they're, they're kind of neat. Um, we can unroll hay, of course, in, in pastures, and that's one way to get more even nutrient distribution. Um, again, a lot of workforce, too. So let's talk about bale grazing. So what is bale grazing? Bale grazing is when we're going to set bales out, usually about this time of the year, and we set them out in a pasture, and then we use poly wire to graze just a few bales at a time. And this can be a very effective way for increasing the improving the nutrient distribution of those bales across the field. And I'm going to show you um, some, <clears throat> some slides from Nick and, and Fred on their, their project they did in Adair County. So just, just thinking about some considerations for bale grazing, you know, we need to store, start with a soil test so we know where we should be targeting our bale grazing at, right? We want to target on the, the paddocks lowest in uh, nutrients. 
we want to, we need fence and water infrastructure to bale graze with, very similar to what we would need to graze stockpiled tall fescue with. So we'll need a hot wire um, to limit the access to, to only several bales at a time. We'll want to feed the bales with a hay ring to um, help improve utilization. Landscape position, you know, I know it's just common sense, but hill slopes or higher ground is going to be a lot better for bale grazing in the wintertime, right, than, than the bottom. If you've got a wet bottom, not, not a great choice to bale graze. And then soil type, you know, as we get challenged in this part of the state with uh, fragile pan soils, which perch water in the wintertime, and they can be pretty tough in some cases, so we need to consider that also. And then thinking ahead of time about where am I going to go if something really goes wrong with the weather. So if, if I get really, really just sopping wet and there's, um, they're just tearing the pasture to pieces, having a place to go is going to be important and thinking about that before it happens is even more important. And then what density of bales should we put out? And, and, and Nick and I talked about that quite a bit today. Just wanted to point out this this is called an uh, electrical offset. So this is an old woven wire fence. We put an electrical offset on it. They're really easy to install. Actually brought a couple to show you, but I forgot them in the car. I'll show, get them after I'm done. Um, they're really easy to, to install. They hold an electrified piece of high tensile fence about a foot off of the fence. Now what's nice about that is we can run it around the perimeter of the pasture and then we can hook a poly wire into this anywhere we want to stretch across the bale graze in our pastures or further subdivide them during the grazing season. So, so these are some different bale densities. And, um, and, and I would encourage you, if you want to try this, don't, don't start at a high density. That's kind of a, a bad place to start. Start at a low density, one to two bales per acre. And... Um, and that means they're going to be about 150 feet apart, right, the bales. If we have moderate density, three to four bales per acre, they're going to be about 100 to 120 feet apart. And then we get into a high density, and then the last one has lost your mind. And that's when we just put way too many bales out per acre. And, and the first year that Fred Thomas did this, he, he was at this, this density, and it kind of tore his pastures all to pieces. So it's important to start start a little bit lighter, and as you get some experience with it and get a feel for it, then you can increase your density as you go on. So this is a, a, a drone picture from Fred Thomas's farm as he's feeding these bales out. This was probably at a density of uh, three to four bales per acre, I would say, um, on his particular farm. Everyone's worried about what happens underneath each one of these bales, and we do will get some damage underneath these bales for sure. But we're getting such a nice distribution. Usually, they fill back in fairly quickly. A lot of times, um, they'll fill in with some summer annual grasses like crabgrass uh, in those areas. So, if, if you're interested in bale grazing, but but you have a good cool season sod, and you really want to limit the amount of damage from, from the bale grazing, then stay at that density of one to two bales per acre. You know, if, if you're not, not so worried and you don't mind having a little bit of summer annual grass in those spots, then you can go up to, to three to four or five bales an acre. So this was Fred's first year, and he, he had a bale density of around 12 bales per acre. So that was lost your mind density, right? And he tore his pasture all to pieces that first year. And, um, and he said, well, I'll just look at it as an opportunity. So he came in after this, and he planted um, sorghum Sudan grass there, grazed sorghum Sudan grass all summer long in that area. And then he came back and planted a novel endophyte tall fescue in the fall. So, so he was kind of making lemonade out of lemons. But the point is, is don't start that high if, if you want to try this. This is really kind of an amazing slide. This was from this, so this was his high density bale grazing. And this is just one year of, of data. So I'll just point out here, this is the bottom. So this is a place where he had fed hay for, for maybe 10 years in the same place. We had very high nutrient levels. Our phosphorus test was 595 pounds. We say don't add any phosphorus after 60 pounds. 
So, so very high. Potassium was 927. You know, all those nutrients from that hay that he'd been feeding in the same place for year after year um, had concentrated in that area. Okay, this was a field that he was, that field that he was um, bale grazing in the previous picture. This was what the soil test level was before he bale grazed. So we had 30, so that's, that's um, what is the 30, guys, for soil test range? I'm testing you. So 60 is high, 30 is probably in the medium, medium to low, low plus maybe. Um, potassium, 104 pounds, so that's in the low range. And then just one year after, so that following year, he'd increased the, with a very heavy bale grazing, he increased phosphorus to 90, so that's in, in past the high range, and potash to 349 with just one year of bale grazing. And, and I questioned Nick about this, and he said, you know, I, I was hesitant to show those numbers because of the large increase. But when you think about it, 12 bales per acre, I mean, you're bringing a tremendous amount of nutrients into that, that system with that high of a density. Now, we wouldn't recommend that for, for, to start at. We'd recommend something lower. So this is a kind of a summary of his farm for over a seven-year period from when he started and um, ended. And this is phosphorus when he started in 2014. He was at 20 to 30 pounds, so he was in that, that low range for phosphorus. And potash was extremely low on this farm, 71 to 78. So after uh, seven years of bale grazing, he's up past 160 with, with phosphorus, and um, he's kind of crazy high with, with potash on, on these fields where he's introduced these nutrients back in through the bale grazing. So the question becomes is, what does he do with these fields that are testing so high, right? What, what's the opportunity there? Well, if he has extremely high nutrients, he can go in and make hay off of those fields that are testing high and feed them in fields that are testing low. So, so there's real opportunity there. If you're buying hay, I mean, into your system, you're bringing those nutrients into your system. So if you're trying to build a farm back up that's been kind of neglected or, or let go for a few years, I mean, this is a really good opportunity for building that, that farm up. And um, I'll, just, I'll just end with this slide on the bale grazing. This was um, the cover slide from Fred Thomas's presentation. Um, and there, those presentations are available on our KY Forages YouTube channel. So just Google KY Forages YouTube. It'll bring up that channel, and they're right on the front page. This is Nick's and Fred's presentation for our, from our grazing conference uh, a couple weeks ago. Okay, tip number seven, incorporate legumes into grazing systems. Nothing new here. Um, legumes are an important part of sustainable grassland ecosystems because they take nitrogen from the air, which is 78% nitrogen, fix it into a plant available form, and share it. Um, with that plant. They increase both yield and uh, quality and, and subsequently animal performance. They improve summer growth. Um, and then important for us is they dilute the endophyte and tall fescue. And we've always thought it was just a dilution effect, but there's actually research coming out of our USDA uh, Ag Research Unit in Lexington that shows that red clover actually has a set of compounds called isoflavones, and um, they actually counteract the negative effect of the ergot alkaloids that are produced by the endophyte. So the ergot alkaloids cause the blood vessels in the animal to shrink, and then the animal can't cool itself that well in the summertime because it cools itself by pumping blood to the skin, and then the heat radiates off. When the vascular system shrinks, it has problems cooling itself in the summer and keeping itself warm in the winter. Um, the isoflavones are actually vasodilators, and they actually cause those vessels to, to dilate again in the animal. Yeah. So, Ceresia is a, well, it's a complex animal, right? So, 
it, it's, I think it's really good for small ruminants. If you're grazing small ruminants, um, it's, it's certainly a go-to. If you're grazing cattle, you need to make sure it's below your knees. If it gets above your knees, then it'll really lose its palatability. Can, can make a pretty good hay product. It's got a compound called tannins that make it taste not so good, astringent. And um, when we cure it for hay, that, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you have to be careful when you bale it because it's very susceptible to leaf shatter like alfalfa would be when you're baling it. It's, it's not, a, not a legume that most people would use, but if you have it, if you're on reclaimed mine land or um, somehow it's gotten your pastures, it, it could, could be an opportunity for you to use it in the grazing system. We, we had it in a... When I was a graduate student at the University of Kentucky and we, we did a landscape scale grazing study in southeastern Kentucky and that was the primary legume in our pastures. And the, the, uh, the animals did well grazing in that system. Just a little bit about the value of nitrogen fixed by different legumes and, and currently we're, at, we're here at a dollar a pound and, and uh, we're looking at somewhere between $75 and $150 worth of nitrogen fixed by red clover and white clover per acre per year. So it's a big deal. If we, get, if we can get and maintain 30% clover in our stands, we're going to really reduce the amount of nitrogen we need for the grazing system. Now, one thing to remember is that, that nitrogen is shared with the grass plant, but is shared indirectly, and the animals are an important part of that sharing. So the animal grazes the legume, ingests it, it uses some of that nitrogen or protein in the legume for growth and maintenance of the animal, but a lot of it gets excreted in the urine. And, and that's how the nitrogen um, in other nutrients and legumes get shared. It's kind of indirectly with the grass plant through ingestion and decomposition, or ingestion and deposition of you know, dung and urine. The other way it gets shared is that um, parts of the plant gets, it could be leaves or stem, gets trampled down the soil surface and then all the microbes and the earthworms and the insects break that down and incorporate it back into the soil where the grass plant can use those nutrients that are released. There's really little direct transfer between a grass and legume plant, so the animals are really important part of that whole transfer. Tip eight, frost seed clover. Um, frost seeding is simply broadcasting seed on the soil surface. We do this in, in February usually in this part of the state. And then that freezing and that thawing action where it gets warm during the day and cold at night causes little cracks to form in the soil and that incorporates that seed into the soil. This can be a very effective method for uh, overseeding clover onto pastures. Works best with red and white clover. <laughs> And uh, a good general recommendation is six to eight pounds of red clover and a pound or two of ladino clover because the seed is so much smaller on the white clover. And there's three types of white clover. There's a ladino or a large type of white clover. It produces about three to five times as much dry matter as the Dutch white clover. And then there's the uh, Dutch white or a native white clover that's um, much less productive. And then we have a medium type of white clover that's kind of a grazing type it has kind of an intermediate height and productivity. So just some tips for frost seeding success. We want to make sure that we graze our pastures close before we broadcast the seed. Put it out in plenty of time so that we have lots of freezing and thawing cycles to incorporate that seed into the soil. Had a question today of whether it's too early to frost seed, and it is a little bit early to frost seed. The, the danger right now of throwing that seed out is that it could germinate and then not make it through the winter. So we probably want to wait till we get into at least mid to late January before we start to throw seed out. Um, and then consider, comp or you need to control competition after seeding. So at, a lot of times after we do everything right and we broadcast our seed out, it germinates and comes up and we take the animals off. That's probably one of the worst things we can do. We want the animals to be on that pasture. They can walk some seed in. They, they keep the pasture sod grazed down as it starts to grow in the spring and that lets light in for those little clover seedlings that are starting to develop. And you're going to trample some of those seedlings and some of them will get nipped off, but um, overall when it gets tall enough, 
Just pull all the animals off, let it get about six inches tall, then put that paddock back in your rotation. Make sure you use high quality seed. Um, we have, I don't know if you have any here, the variety testing books. Um, we have a long-term summary of variety testing. It's available online on our Forages webpage. Um, make sure you use a good variety. There's a number of varieties out there. Probably one of the best ones and one of the oldest ones is one called Kenland, Red Clover. Kenland was developed at the University of Kentucky and is still a leader in the forage variety trials after all these years. And the important thing to remember about Kenland is if you're going to use Kenland, make sure you get certified seed so it'll have a blue tag on it and it'll say certified. You can get Kenland that's non-certified, but you don't know what's in that bag, and it's probably not Kenland. It's probably a medium red clover from Saskatchewan or somewhere. Um, our variety trials have shown that non-certified Kenland yields about 70% of what a certified Kenland seed would yield. Make sure you use the correct seeding rate, so that means you need to... to um, to calibrate your drill or your seeder or whatever you're putting that seed out with. And make sure you get even seed distribution in the pastures. And that's, that's a lot easier to, to say than to do in many cases. A lot of times you can't see where you've been unless it's just snowed in a pasture. Um, and we did a little study at the research station where we, um, where we seeded with or without a little mobile GPS unit that we can move from implement to implement. And uh, so what we did was we activated it and then we covered it with a bag and then we let the operator frost seed a pasture. And then he came back and we let him frost seed the same pasture again but with the, with the GPS unit. And what we found was the tendency of the operator was not to have skips but, but to have overlap. And, um, and it was a lot. It was, on average, 35% overlap. So just think about that for one minute. If, if we're spending 35% more on our clover seed because we're overlapping so much, we can pay for this unit in, in just a season or two very easily. Plus, you can use these mobile G, GPS units on to spray with or to drill with or anything else that's a space relationship in a grazing system. Um, tip nine, manage nitrogen applications. So what's that mean? Um, nitrogen's only a good investment if you're going to use the forage. Probably the worst time that we can put nitrogen on a pasture would be when? The spring, exactly. Because we've already got more forage than we can keep up with, right? So we're making that problem even worse by putting nitrogen on the spring. If we're going to spend nitrogen money on nitrogen in the grazing system, it's much better to spend it in late summer, early fall, where we can stimulate some fall growth for winter grazing and stockpile. And um, recommendations for nitrogen are normally given in, as a range. In um, if nitrogen is a dollar a pound, we probably need to be staying towards the low end of that range. And then uh, time it to plant growth. So we don't want to put it on before plants are actively growing. We want the plant to be actively growing so that it grabs that nitrogen and we don't lose it um, from the system. And the last thing I'll mention is that pastures can, can, especially if we're doing a good job with grazing management and we've done a good job with um, keeping legumes you know, our pastures, they can develop a very strong nitrogen cycle over time. So sometimes when we apply nitrogen to pastures, we don't get as much response as we would expect um, if we have a strong nitrogen cycle. All right, the last thing I want to mention is, is to watch hay fields closely. And, and, you know, when fertilizer prices are high, we tend to put less fertilizer on. But, but it's important to realize that hay... hay is a big nutrient removal from, from forage systems. If we look at something like orchard grass, we remove about 36 pounds of nitrogen in every ton of hay, 15 pounds of um, phosphate, and about 55 pounds of K2O. So if we had a good year and we're yielding three tons of, of orchard grass per acre, you know, all of a sudden we're removing 45 pounds of phosphorus in, you know, 160, 170 pounds of potash. 
you can do that for a year or two, but if you continue to do that over time, you're going to draw the nutrient levels down the pasture. I can almost always tell you when I look at the soil test whether it's from a hay field. If it's from a hay field, it always is going to be low in potash. Not always, but most of the time. One of the first visits I had when I came to Kentucky was with a Bermuda grass producer on the other side of the lakes, and uh, he said, I don't know what's happening. My, my productivity has just gone down and down and down, and it's just miserable right now. And when we look close, I mean, he had drawn his potash down to almost nothing in that stand because he wasn't putting enough on. Normally, we just don't put enough potash back in hay production systems. So make sure and keep a close eye on, on your... Um, on your soil fertility levels. And when you're creeping down to that medium, low medium, low part of the medium range in hay production system, you really need to be thinking about putting some P and K on even if the price is high. It, it's going to take a while to build fertility back up and it won't happen all at one time. There's different strategies. So the the soil testing lab at University of Kentucky is, is um, more conservative with their buildup. So when it's in the low range, you get a, a recommendation for what you're removing, right? Plus some to build it up. And we tend to be a little bit more conservative. Now, if you go to a commercial lab, um, a lot of times they're much more aggressive on the buildup end. So their recommendations will be higher to get you built back up faster. But it's going to take several years to get it back, build up to arrange, and you probably wouldn't want to build it up all in one year right now, for sure. Is there any questions? <coughs> yeah, so, so when you're, and I failed to mention that, I meant to put a slide in, but um, yeah, so when you're bale grazing, you always want to use a hay ring on those bales. And there was, um, Katie Van Valen showed an interesting uh, photo from, I think she got it from Jeff Lemkohler last night, and it was comparing different rings for feeding hay. And the f hay feeding losses for a shielded ring around the bottom were much less. So, so if you could use a shielded ring, that would be ideal. And actually, I just had a question, I, I think it was, I can't remember if it was from Missouri or further west, but it was a, a guy that's interested in bale grazing, but he... He uses a cone feeder. I don't know if you've ever seen those. They kind of come down like this. And that's a very efficient hay feeder, but probably not good for a bale grazing situation unless you're really strong and can lift that bale up in there. So. Yeah, poly pipe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And unfortunately, the the people that are bale grazing like to use those because they're pretty light, you know, compared to the metal ones. But you're probably better off with the metal one, if, especially if you can get one that's shielded on the bottom, if you can handle them. And you do have to roll those hay rings to the next bale and put them on the next bale. So logistics of, of bale grazing would be you would start at, you would start with your fence here give them access to several bales at a time, and then set a second fence up so that when you take the first one down, they don't run all the way through your, your field, right? So just like your stockpiling tall fescue, grazing strip grazing stockpile tall fescue, you want to have that back fence set up before you take the front fence down. Is there any other questions? Uh, <laughs> So, so when coatings were first coming out, um, Ray Smith at uh, University of Kentucky did some work, and what they found was that the, the coating in legume seed, not grass seed, but legume seed, um, enhanced germination so that if you planted um, fewer seeds but they were coated, then uh, the equal rate of raw seed or uncoated seed, you still got a similar stand at, at the end. 
So the coated seed works for legumes for sure. And the nice thing about the coated seed is that it comes with sometimes some micronutrients, but most importantly, inoculated. So that, that was rhizobium bacteria right there. Otherwise, you really need to be inoculating your uncoated seed. So, so the, the, the answer is no. If, if, you've had, if you've had clover in that field in the last three, three or four years, you probably don't need to inoculate it. But inoculation is so cheap. I mean, it's just a really cheap insurance policy that you're going to get optimum nitrogen fixation because it's going to be the right strain of bacteria. The bacteria are specific strains for different legumes. That's a great question. Usually, um, I, th I think if you would use a, a coated seed, the inoculant would already be on it. W when you're mixing seed with fertilizer, you want to mix it and spread it immediately. Um, we're just, fin Edwin and I are just finishing up a study where we, we took fertilizer and mixed clover seed in with it and then let it set for anywhere from 1 to 28 days. And we had significant decline in germination like, like this with red clover seed and blended fertilizer. And by the end of the 28 days, we were down less than 10% germination. So it's really important if you're going to do that practice to, to get it in, get it mixed, and get it spread. And if you can do that before it gets, starts to pick moisture up from the air, you're going to really keep your germination higher. Well, the ammonium sulfate is much probably a much more expensive nitrogen source. It's going to supply, I think, 20 pounds of, of sulfur. And if you need sulfur, it could be a good source. But most of our forages are probably not needing sulfur yet. Although we just completed an alfalfa survey from around the state. I've got a graduate student that's working on um, looking at the nutrient status of alfalfa stands. He sampled 53 alfalfa stands last year. 13% were below the sufficiency level for sulfur when we did tissue testing. So it could be an emerging issue. As the um, air standards get cleaner and we have less coal burning power plants, the, the sulfur is going to be a bigger issue. When I left Virginia, we were starting to see fairly routinely sulfur deficiencies on the lighter soils near the coastal plains that um, don't hold uh, nutrients quite as well. So when would you use ammonium sulfate? I guess if you could get a good deal on it. Um, but otherwise, I, I would tend to use another nitrogen source, unless you need the sulfur. Any other questions? Thanks for your attention. I'll turn it over to, to Kenny.